melting temperature of iron and steel. Blast furnaces produce three things. Gas that has some caloric value and hence can be reused. Slag that can be used as roadbed and in other applications. And cast or pig iron. Advances have reduced the time needed to produce a batch of steel from 13 hours in 1942 to six and a half hours in 1943 to about 15 minutes today. Tapping a furnace after a predetermined time produces a steel of predetermined carbon content. Manganese or other materials are added to halt the reaction between carbon and oxygen. If you, if you do it all right, then you wind up with, uh, with a carbon content that you want. But it isn't the only way to do it. You don't, you don't have to go through the open hearth. The open hearth is a very dirty furnace. Uh, the pollution authorities in this country would like to get rid of all of the open hearth furnaces. And in fact, they've gotten rid of most of the open hearth furnaces in this country. It's because it's very hard to collect all of the dust that comes out of the stacks. All of the gases that are toxic in the material. Uh, it costs a lot of money. And so there are other, other processes that we use for melting. And if we look at the next slide, <coughs> what we will see is uh, a kind of furnace that we could use. And we wouldn't have to start with molten pig iron. We could start with solid pig iron. We could start with just scrap. We could start with mixtures of molten material and scrap. And this, in this particular case, we have a, an arc furnace, an electric arc furnace. We have big electrodes. They run up to eight inches in diameter. Uh, we put a charge in here inside the furnace in this, in this hearth. We lower these rods down and develop a tremendous amount of arcing here, a tremendous amount of thermal energy is developed, and it melts the heat down, takes it to the temperature we want. We can keep it molten as long as we want to keep it molten. We can make additions to it very carefully. Uh, we can tap the slag off on one side into a slag pot, that, and we can tap the furnace just by tilting the furnace over, as shown by the dotted lines, and pour it into the ladle and go ahead and process it. Now, if we were going to make a material like, let's say, stainless steel, where we want to make an uh, enormous alloy addition, let's say something like 18% chromium, 8% nickel, in the steel, that, that's what we would want to have, said 18.8 stainless steel. Then we would use a furnace like this particular furnace, like this uh, arc furnace, to make the heat in because we have so much more control. But we're going to lose ground on volume. If you need an ingot that's going to, or uh, need a quantity of material that's going to be 200 tons, then we wouldn't get it out of an arc furnace because we get a maximum capacity out of these things of something in the neighborhood of 50 tons. <coughs> well, it's not the only way we can do it, and we should look at the BOF. And in the next slide, <coughs> we see a BOF, which is actually uh, the modern-day version of what most people refer to as a Bessemer converter and what should be called a Kelly converter. I have to get this in because the, the Bessemer converter was not invented by Sir Henry Bessemer, or he doesn't get credit for it, really. It was invented by a man named Kelly, uh, who was a blacksmith in Kentucky. And he invented the system, and he, he was not a very good entrepreneur. He didn't succeed in, in selling his product. He had, a, he had family problems, and, and he just couldn't get it off the ground. And Bessemer invented the same thing later in England, and he was a nobility and an entrepreneur, a very wealthy man, and he, had, uh, he was a captain of industry, and he got his system going. When he came to this country, he found out he couldn't do, the, do it in this country because Kelly owned the patents. So he made an agreement with Kelly. He says, okay, I will, I will use your, the system. I'll make all the money I can. I'll share it with you if you call it the Bessemer Converter. And so Kelly, not being stupid, said, okay. And so it's called a Bessemer converter. But in the Bessemer converter, all we really did was to take a great big bucket with a false floor in it that had a lot of holes in it. And we put the pig iron in that Bessemer converter. And we blew air up through all those little holes in the bottom. 
Okay? And you see, we're doing the same thing now <coughs> in that we're supplying oxygen, but with the air. And as we supply the oxygen, it burns the excess carbon out, blows it out the top of the converter as actually as carbon sometimes because we get the material that's carbon monoxide that will, when it drops back to carbon dioxide because of the pressure and temperature, it'll, it'll leave behind some graphite. I, I used to live in a steel city in Sparrows Point, Maryland. And I walked the sidewalks in, si in Sparrows Point, Maryland and it glittered with graphite all over the sidewalks. Or if you hung your clothes out to dry and within five minutes they're spotted with, we called it pay dirt. But, but it was a real pollution problem. And we blew an awful lot of gas through the Bessemer converter. That was unnecessary since the ratio of the gas <coughs> in the air is principally nitrogen. The ratio of nitrogen to oxygen is tremendous. Then we're blowing through a lot of nitrogen that we didn't even need. And so the Bessemer converter has been replaced by this BOF. And if we look at that, we find out it's nothing more than a big bucket of, of uh, steel that we can charge. We, we, we bring in a, a scrap charging car and we put solid iron in it. We have to bring in enough molten material to cover that or to make uh, at least a partial fluid mi mi mix in it. <coughs> and then we have up here this little thing which is called an oxygen lance. And it's a refractory material through which we're going to blow nascent oxygen. That is, instead of blowing air through it now with 85% nitrogen, what we're going to do is we're going to blow just raw oxygen into the furnace. And then lower this thing down until it's almost at the surface and turn this high velocity jet of oxygen on, which penetrates the melt and blows it under the surface. And we have this tremendous stirring action, this violent reaction between the oxygen and, and the carbon that's in the iron. And by the way, blowing back some iron oxide, converting some of the iron back to oxide, but principally blowing out the carbon and until we decide by now pre-calculation or primarily by looking at the fumes that come out of this and analyzing them directly very rapidly with our computer technology today and say it's ready to tap. And then they can tilt this thing over on the side and pour through the tap hole <coughs> into the teeming ladle <coughs> the material that we have just processed. That particular material, that particular furnace now, the basic oxygen furnace, the BOF, can produce 200 tons of steel in about 15, 20 minutes. The Bessemer converter could only convert 15 tons of steel in the same period of time. And the open hearth furnace converts that amount of material, 200 tons of steel, in about six hours. <coughs> so we have moved up scale in our capability of producing the material. <coughs> and it says every half an hour we can run that furnace again. <coughs> Since we can do that, we have no problem with a source of molten metal. And what we need to do now is to be able to take care of it. Well, do we have to kill the material that comes out of the BOF? The answer is yes. It's just like the material that comes out of the open hearth. We treat it the same way. But we put it in this thing called a teeming ladle. And a teeming ladle is a very unusually designed vessel, not one that you'd want to drink coffee out of. But this is an enormous vessel now that will hold, say, 200 tons of steel. And when we're through casting into it from the open hearth of the BOF or the Bessemer, whatever we, we're, wherever we're making our steel, we find that we'll have a level up here of, of steel and on top of it will be a level of slag. The slag prevents the steel from continuing to oxidize, but we don't want to pour it into the ladle because if we do, we get contaminations. We get non-metallic inclusions in the ingot of steel and we don't want that. So what we do is we pour it out of the bottom. That is, the crane picks up this enormous ladle and carries it bottom down, never tilts it. And when you get it over top of an uh, ingot mold, which would be situated down here, then you pull on a little trigger over here. You just pull down on this thing, which elevates this plunger, which opens, <coughs> which opens this particular gate and allows the material to pour out, and that's called teaming. So although you got 200 tons of steel, you can go in a steel mill today and find a little lady pulling on this thing to, to team all this amount, enormous amount of material into an ingot mold. <coughs> well, we get the material in the ingot mold, and after we do that, we have all sorts of problems. 
Now I'm going to recite a few, and in the last lecture, in the last lesson, when we're going to talk about quality control, we're going to have to come back and consider some of these things. But right now I want to just tell you of some of the ingot defects that we get when we use the system. Number one, despite the fact that we pour out of the bottom and don't have any slag mixed with it, we have a stream of metal which is very, very hot and which is going to burn very easily. Iron burns very easily. In fact, one of the worst things you can have in your household and storage is very fine steel wool. If you have any, like 4-0, strike a match to it someday and see what happens. It'll, it'll run up and give you temperatures like 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, like that. But if this stream of metal is coming out of the teeming ladle and it's surrounded by air, it's con continually oxidizing, right? But what's worse than that is it has to fall a long distance. We may cast an ingot, uh, which may be, say, 10 feet tall, 8 feet tall. And this big high density material, this big mass of high density material hits the bottom and splashes. It splashes up onto the side of the ingot mold, and if it's stuck there, then the surface of it would oxidize, and as the molten metal came up around it, it wouldn't properly knit or weld together. So when you strip the ingot mold off of the material, then we would have uh, it contained on the surface of the material. It would come off with the ingot, but it wouldn't be properly bonded. Now, what do you call something that goes along for the ride? Uh, well, let's see, I guess the unions call that a scab, right? You call it a scab if it's on you, if it's a sore or something. And on the ingot, we call it a scab. And so it's a defect that's there and it has to be removed it's a superfluous piece of material that will never properly bond to the surface or if it's stuck to the mold and we pull the ingot out it, it could actually tear along that line and if that would be a seam and in the rolling subsequent rolling operations it may incorporate oxygen into that little valley that you cut into the surface of the material when the material solidifies it can solidify now by burping out all of the things that are not soluble in the solid state like gases it might dissolve so we may have porosity in the material we have may have non-metallic inclusions that are pushed out into the solidifying mass uh, we may they, we will have dendritic solidification in this particular process and so the dendrites will grow and hang on to those little impurities or gaseous things gaseous uh, pockets and it will be distributed all through the material. The dirt and whatnot will be shoved out continually toward the inside and in the very center of it we have a, a defect that we always have to fight because as the molten metal solidifies it shrinks. It shrinks in the liquid state and then the transformation from liquid to solid is one of reduced volume or reduced density. And so what happens is since it's solidifying from the mold wall in there's a cavity that's developed that goes all the way through the ingot and a hole through a mass of material we call a pipe and so we have a defect that's called a pipe. So we have blow holes, non-metallic inclusions, pipes, scabs, seams, and overlaps. All of these is ingot defects that require proper preparation of the mold, proper teaming, and a lot of care and quality control to get a finished product way down the line. But a lot of it starts right here with the casting of the ingot. Open hearth furnaces have largely been phased out by electric ore furnaces, now popular for batches up to about 50 tons. A basic oxygen furnace, or BOF, blows oxygen gas into the molten iron through a probe to precisely control carbon content. Once its content is correct, molten steel goes into a teeming ladle and is poured from the bottom into an ingot mold. Ingot defects include blowholes, non-metallic inclusions, pipes, scabs, seams, and overlaps.